from the dead of night, peering through the veil of darkness, the paranormal, spiritual, and comedic abound. Welcome to the Richard Spazoff Show. Hello, 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 everybody. Welcome to the show. Happy to have you. <laughs> Happy to have you here tonight. I was talking to myself and the volume was somewhere else. What could I say? I'm a technology expert. Only if I have a shoestring and two cans, then I'm a technology expert. Uh, you're listening to the Richard Spassoff Show. It's brought to you by Audible. You can find us on our website at the Psychic Medium Spassoff Show dot com. Uh, also, the Richard Spassoff Podcast is a proud member of the Universal Network family of podcasts and available on Android and coming soon iDevices. To get all the great stuff, you could go to the Universal Network dot com. I'd like to thank uh, Christopher Jordan for all his help. i also like to give a big thank you to TalkStream Live for putting us aboard their website. Thank you, Tom, and thank you, Bill. We'll be right back after these brief commercials. Hopefully, I'll be right back. Hey, is that a new music app? Yeah, check it out. Surfer Music Discovery. It links to thousands of online stations, but the twist is you see the song names and artists that are now playing live. That's different. No guessing. Looks like a waterfall of music. So many formats. Rock, oldies, country, R&B, jazz, and a whole lot more. How's that spelled? Surfer. S-U-R-F-R. Is it expensive? It's free. No need to sign up or sign in. Get the Surfer Music app free from Google Play or the App Store. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk Entertainment. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. Hello and welcome back to the Richard Spassoff Show with tonight's guest or today's guest or whatever time frame you're in. We have the skeptical psychic, Nancy. Now, since I don't want to botch your last name, Nancy, how do you pronounce your name for us? Oh, you're, you're just way too kind. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody botches it, so I have no expectations. It could be, I mean, technically, it's Duterte, but nobody gets that. So it's going to be something like Duterte, 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 uh, Duterte, uh, or I do tell people I will answer to two turtles if they really run out of options. <laughs> now, is that nationality French? Or it sounds like it, but only because of, I don't know if I'm right or not. But uh. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's it's French. My husband uh, is, he, he was born in France. He is French. And he's recently be, become American. And I am originally American uh, and have also become French. Well, congratulations on both. I don't know what I am, but I'm here. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> now, you have quite a list. I mean, you were an attorney before you became a psych psychic. Is that correct? Well, since I'm an attorney, I will correct you. Okay. <laughs> and <laughs> I will tell you that I am still an attorney. I'm still licensed good. in uh, New York and New Jersey, so I'm just, uh, I, I just don't practice, you know, to the same degree uh, that I used to. And I've really refocused my career. And I, I spent uh, 10 years apprentice to a well-known psychic detective. Did that, worked with law enforcement, still do that, um, but not as an apprentice. I, I have trained in uh, mediumship. Uh, I've trained in all different styles of remote viewing. Um, what else can I tell you? Well, can you tell us what 
experiences you went through when you were being a detective and what you came across? Can you give us a story? Uh, well, I mean, what I can't, I, for me, the most, it's going to be the least interesting to anybody else, but the most interesting <laughs> thing to me was, you know, my own personal journey coming from somebody who was completely evidence-based, who didn't believe in anything psychic, never had any experience with any of that, uh, come from a family background where it doesn't exist. And I kind of stumbled into this field because I was interested in the psychology of intuition. So, uh, and then I figured in order to talk about it, I had to train in it. And once I trained in it, m my personal discovery was that I seemed to have some ability, which was a big shock to me. And I argued with everybody for years. <laughs> um, but then finally figured, okay, I guess I got to acknowledge that. In terms of stories, yeah, I mean, I would, most of the cases that, you know, we have worked on have generally been, um, we, I mean, they come in as missing persons, but they're generally homicides. Okay. Um, you know, you get your, your occasional um, missing animals. Uh, y y there are other, you know, varieties of cases, but generally they're, they're the very serious ones. Um, and I've had the interesting um, experience, I guess you could say, of being allowed to travel around with uh, different um, uh, law enforcement and police officers who have taken me to, you know, after I've given them my initial readings, to then go and take a look at uh, serial killers as they are wandering <laughs> around. Oh boy! Okay. Okay. Uh, oh yeah, that's kind of uh, that's a little uh, daunting. Uh, and then being able to, you know, where the, they'll take me to the place, for example, where I have pinpointed on a map and said, I think the body of the missing person is there, and then you know get a chance to look at it. And I've been told on several occasions that that. You know, of all of the pinpoint locations anywhere, um, you know, that that was, these were exact places where they had, the police had excavated or dredged or looked specifically for bodies. And the problem is, in this business, um, very often you're dealing with cold cases. So if there was a body, Odds are either it got washed away if there's an ocean or, you know, water there or animals have dragged it or, you know, it's just been sort of buried under whatever. But but there must be some type of debris left from the body to know that it was there, correct? Well, that's what I always try to tune into. So, um you know, but again, if you're dealing with clothing, that's that's very often going to go. Okay. Particularly if you're looking at something that's, you know, 10 years old. Um, I try to identify um, jewelry. Um, a lot of times you have, I mean, what you're doing is sort of corroborating a lot of times with the, the police investigation. So if you're helping them to get onto whatever the is the right track. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there've been times where I've been able to accurately describe suspects, um, accurately give names of, um, victims or, um, suspects or witnesses. And so all of that, you know, as, as far as I'm concerned, since I'm not the one out there doing the, um, you know, boots on the ground kind of work, um, you know, I'm, I'm just supplying a, a type of a tool to help law enforcement in their efforts. Did it take them a while to accept you with what you do? But you already had the background of being the the attorney, attorney, attorney. So how did they accept you? Did some take it as a joke? Did some take it ser seriously? I mean, you know. I mean, at least with my experience with um the with law enforcement is that first of all if they're even going to talk to you it means that they are at least willing to take you seriously yes and they're not going to laugh at you if they're not going to talk to you at all odds are they're going to laugh at you right, right. 
Um, although, I mean, there's a whole, I, I, uh, co-wrote, uh, this was a while back. I co-wrote the memoirs of a, uh, it's a, a former homicide detective from New York, mm-hmm. New York city. And what I was kind of interested in initially was that there's this whole undercurrent that goes on with the police, which is, you know, they will sort of publicly mock or make fun of the psychics, but you go behind the scenes and they, many, many of them will take them seriously. It's just a matter if you could prove to them what you do, right? I th- yeah, and, and that is always sort of the catch-22. Mm-hmm. And I get asked about that by, you know, lots of, uh, you know, young psychics wanting to sort of get into the biz and they say, well, you know, what do, what do I have to do? Should I, should I call up the police because I keep getting this recurring vision of whatever? And I tell people, be really careful about that because I certainly know people who have gotten themselves uh, at least initially implicated uh, into very serious homicide uh, investigations because they called up and they, you know, out of the blue and they gave information. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, how do you protect the, yourself? How do you protect yourself? But then how do you get to be known as being accurate? Mm-hmm. So that's what I'm saying is like the catch 22. It's tough. I remember, uh, I had a ex wife that I worked with Betty Lebrun. Now she's a, a minister at the time, but I have a new girlfriend, <laughs> but I'm oh. saying, <laughs> <laughs> I, since I men- mentioned the ex-wife, you know you have to mention the girlfriend. But uh, it was only a 30-day marriage. It would have lasted longer if she would have remained in that state of coma. But we were... <laughs> oh. oh. Uh, no, no, no. We were together for about a year. But during that time, she always took me along as a human lie detector when she uh, quite questioned the suspects. And she wanted me to know, you know, what I felt. Where, where do you think they put the ev- evidence? So at least with her, I had an in. And that's what I would say you need to do. I wouldn't just call the police and go, you know, I feel this about the murder that you have. And uh, not a good idea. You're going to wind up <laughs> you wind up with Al Capone. I mean. Well, well yeah, exactly. I mean, and, and there is that. Oh, and by the way, so your ex-wife was a, or she is a detective? She was, yeah. She was. Oh, that's interesting. And then uh, after she left me, she became a minister. So something must have happened. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I guess after you after you left, uh, she saw the light. So You never know in life, exactly. You never, <laughs> never know. <laughs> Get me out of here. Ah! Yeah. But, you know, the the other danger is, you know, um, is if you, it's sort of what I was saying before, is that you get involved, you give good information to the police. You wanna hey, move- is that a new music app? Yeah. I'm sorry. 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 That's okay. You give new information to the police. And you want to make sure that you are... Yeah, well enough hidden behind the scenes that nobody realizes that you're the one doing, you know, a little bit of, you know, fingering the the suspect or whatever. So you have to be careful on that end also. Yes, there's, I mean, I was a police photographer for a very short time. I spent about 20 years in photography doing my psychic medium work. I mean, I have a wide variety of things I've done in my life, but uh, it was too dark for me to read, to read that kind of environment. I don't know how you deal with the, the emotions of it. How, how do you handle that? Well, I don't have any. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> no, I do, I do, but I happen to be because obviously, I mean, I have many, many friends who are uh, they're psychic, they're empaths, they're mediums, whatever, and uh, most of them would never want to do this kind of work anyway for exactly the same reason that you're talking yes, about. Yes, yes. Um, and if you are, you know, very, very sensitive, and particularly as I think that the empaths tend to be. You know, those those are the people who are just 
you know, they're assuming and taking on the full impact of somebody else's energy um, in a way that could be, well, certainly uncomfortable and maybe dangerous, depending on how far you go with it. Um, but I think the reason, the way I've always explained, you know, why I like it and why I seem to be okay with it mm -hmm. is because I'm, I'm very analytic, um, I'm very left-brained, and I like to figure out puzzles. And so I'm able to distance myself to some degree from all of the emotional trauma mm -hmm. of a situation or of people. I mean, and, and obviously, I mean, the, well, maybe not obviously, but for me, obviously, the greatest joy that I get from doing that is because it's a form of service. Exactly. Yes, you're helping the good pe people out and even the ones that have passed on. Yes, yes. Right. So ultimately, you know, it, 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 it's a dirty job, but somebody's got to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, so and I'm fine with that. I would say the only things that ever have really, really kind of stuck with me uh, over the years has been more um, more the sort of really nasty sort of pedophile type of uh, crimes and, or crimes involved against kids. Can, can we talk about that or no? Uh, well, I mean, to whatever degree I am capable. <laughs> yeah, I mean, give me, it's, it's not good at all to begin with, but give, give me one example of what you mean. What goes on out there? so pe pe people know about it you know one of the things i mean this was quite a while ago but it was a case and i remember looking at a bunch of photos of it was a young girl she was probably around maybe seven years old um mm. she had been raped and murdered and left in an extremely shallow grave um and all I remember was I had, first of all, the, the, the photos themselves, when you see a child like that, you just kind of, it gets indelibly etched into your brain. Definitely, it's, yes, yes. It's really hard to get that out. Um, and then, for whatever reason, I had, um, you know, I think most of the time when you're doing this kind of work, you you're, you tend to tune in to the spirit of the victim. Mm -hmm. So you, you tend to see things from their standpoint, their perspective, their informational standpoint, and all of that. And in this particular case, for whatever reason, I tuned into the, I think there were a couple of suspects, but I tuned into one of them in particular and just couldn't get that energy out of me for the longest time. I mean, I still when I think about it, I still sort of just want to take a bath. Um, cause it just, you go, Ugh. yeah, yeah. Just too, too much filth too. It's, it's beyond it's evil. It's evil. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So you have to be, uh, if you're going to do this kind of work, you have to be very brave mm -hmm. and you have to believe in yourself and you have to know your own power. And I think a lot of people would like to believe in their own power, but don't quite. And if you aren't 100% in, in understanding yourself, what you're capable of, and where you need help if you do, then I think it's a problem. Okay, I understand the part where you're saying understanding yourself. But how does a person, from your viewpoint, understand what their power is in a sense? Um, I always tell people, understand who your spiritual allies are, because okay. we, we are, I mean, yes, we're spiritual beings, but we're spiritual beings, uh, you know, in, in these little 3D physical um, bodies. So we're not 100% spiritual. And a lot of us, because we get blinded by aspects of the physicality of our existence, which involves, by the way, also the amount of data that comes in through our senses. Mm -hmm. Um, and the things that, you know, survival things, what makes, we have to focus on things that will keep us alive 
versus if you're a spirit, you don't need to focus on those things. You can focus anywhere at all times on anything. Correct, yes. Yeah, because you're not of the world anymore. Right. So if you are understanding your own power, you are understanding, uh, first of all, your own limitations. Okay. You're understanding, second of all, your spiritual allies, because your spiritual allies um, are in that realm. And they can guide you, they can uh, protect you, they can help you. Uh, but you have to know who they are. Exactly, yes, yes. And, and you have to also understand the whole concept of the trickster and being played, okay, which is a whole other aspect. That's a whole new game, yes, yes. Right. And, evil, and yes, no. Go ahead. Evil could could uh, give us a lot of false identifications, energy, and all kinds of deceptive things. Exactly. So you have to kind of always be on your toes, and you have to, you know. I think people who go in thinking everything is sort of you know airy fairy and sweet and lovely, I think that that's a big danger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and you know, and, and by the same token, if you're too skeptical, then that's also a danger. You have to walk that tightrope, but you have to walk it with full knowledge. Now, you call yourself the skeptical psychic. Why did you choose that name? Because I am. Okay. I'm always. I mean, and and I use um, I use the the term skeptical in. I use it in a good way, okay. not a, not a derogatory way. Um, I, you know, I a long time ago I did a, a lecture at uh, it was a new, one of the universities in New York State, and um, it was primarily for the students. And students all loved it. There were four professors sitting in the back row, and at the end there was this Q and A session, and the one of the professors started attacking me on this question of, you know, you call yourself a skeptic, you know, the skeptical psych, you're not skeptical at all. <laughs> and this guy would not leave that alone. Oh, and I tried, to, I tried to explain to him, being skeptical means that you retain an open mind, which is what true scientists do, by the way, um, and you examine all possibilities. But you don't automatically discount possibilities because they don't fall into your religion of of how the world uh, is supposed to be. You leave everything wide open, but you examine everything. I, I don't have an automatic go-to position except for, you know, some accumulated experience that I have in my life, which I rely on. Do you think that you helped this man understood where you were coming from, or he was still stuck where he was at? No, 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 no. He was way too stuck. He actually came down to the podium after the thing and almost came to blows. I mean, the guy was ready to have a fist fight with me. Oh. I, I really, I made him that upset. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it's sad in that way that people can't open and understand yourself. They don't have to believe in it, but they could just understand other people or respect other people. Yeah, and it's, you know, I'm not an idiot. No, um, no. And, and I do have reasons for believing things. And I have thought very carefully about most of the stuff that I speak about. Um, and I don't usually open my mouth until I feel I have something valuable to say. So... Um, so, yeah, so, anyway, so that's the origin of me. And being skeptical, of course, you know, being an attorney, you rely on, on evidence. And being a left brain thinker, you love being able to um, basically to, to reverse engineer any of the origins of your analysis. If you can't do it, you're sort of flying blind. And I, I don't like that feeling at all. But when you are psychic, you are flying blind. Yeah, you, you, yes, yes. You have to be open to possibilities that are occurring within the structure that you're working within. Yeah, and you can't go back and say, oh, yeah, well, I said that because. Well, there is no because. Yeah, it's just, <laughs> yeah. <there's> a, <laughs> well, what, what kind of evidence would you call a 
that a psychic medium has, even though we know it's hunched or, or it's based upon what we feel and see, how does the court look at it as? Has anything changed in that sense, or will it change? Or I mean, as far as I know, and it's been a while since I really looked at that because I sort of got disgusted with it and stopped looking. Um, I don't blame they, you. It, it, none of that will be counted as any type of legitimate uh. Uh, evidence in, in a court of law. Um, they might use it for, you know, a character thing or something else. Um, but no, and, and it's for the reason you can't, you can't back it up. There is no basis for making any statement because you can't even, you know, half the time get, get a, um, another witness who witnessed the same thing that you experienced. Well, just out of curiosity, suppose they did accept it then, and what would they consider that would be ad, admissible in a court of law? I mean, what, like if you said somebody's buried in a black box at this place, and could they consider that as evidence if they found the body in that? Yeah, but the evidence is the body. I know, I know, and, I know. And, and you can't, you're not a witness to anything. Okay. You know, you can retroactively uh it could be assumed that you know what you were able to somehow perceive that no one else could perceive was somehow amazingly uh, related to an actual fact but right. people look at that i mean people have a hard enough time with the concept of synchronicities you know meaningful coincidences as opposed or you know as opposed to something just totally random a random crisscrossing of events because people don't see the um, physical manifestations of intention. Very, I mean, it's very, there are more and more studies these days, um, you know, showing that there are physical manifestations, but they're usually secondary effects okay. as opposed to primary, which makes it still makes it hard. It's so, and not, not, in other words, we're still in a time and age where they can't understand this yet. Well, you tell me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's, it's uh, you wish they would with the pe people like yourself and me and other people that have talents of this na na nature. But what I re really admire about you is you have the spiritual strength and the physical strength to deal with these things that i mean even when you were in court and you might have you had to deal with people that weren't so good per se uh you still had to be strong and this is the same type of thing but taken to a upper scale within the spirit spiritual world is what i'm saying yeah very much so and thank you by the way and uh, <clears throat> i think that to do to do this kind of work, you really do have to be a spiritual warrior in yes. many ways yes. because you're yes. you're fighting public perception, and then you're fighting something in a realm that's beyond the physical, um, and you're you're fighting your own personal doubts, you know. Um, so so you really have to go in there. And it goes back to what I was saying before. You, you've got to go in there strong, knowing yourself. Mm -hmm. Now, um, with the spiritual warfare being involved, I, I would say not only do you have to prepare yourself spiritually, but mentally and phys phys physically as well, right? Because you got to be tough. You got to get ready, ready for these things. And the, I mean, I don't know whether I'm all that tough uh, <laughs> in the physical realm, but... Um, <laughs> you know what I mean. Not, I mean, we're only as tough as we can be in what we're give, given. So. Totally. I mean, you, you, your, your body is your temple, yeah. and, and you've got to take care of it. Correct. And uh, that helps with clearing your mind, like anything else. Although people ask me, they say, well, you know, do you meditate? And my answer is always no, because I get really bored really fast, but... <laughs> 
my whole life is really a meditation. Yeah, there's other forms, exactly. You don't have to sit there and, and at a corner. Everybody has their own way to do things. And what I hear you saying is you're walking within the divine spirit. I hope so, because that's the goal. Yeah, I would say so. Because <laughs> <laughs> if you're not, well, then what are you walking in? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, with the experiences you had in, in law enforcement, do you have any on the outside that you've seen ghosts, out-of-body experiences, anything that might come to you, or you yourself have experience that can't be explained? Oh, yeah. I mean, I got tons of stuff I can't well, explain. Well, let's go for it. <laughs> let's talk about okay. one or two. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, I have a, a friend of mine who lives on the other coast. I'm on, on the East Coast. And she, I had just met her, so I didn't really know her. And I think I'd known her, met her once. And then three months later, she got in touch. And uh, she said, y you uh, showed up in my house. I said, what are you talking about? Because I'd had some some uh, surgery. Mm -hmm. And so I was under anesthesia at the time where she said I was in her house. And she said, not only did she see and hear me, but her husband did also. Oh, boy. So, and uh, apparently I did that more than once. So, but I have no recollection of that. So I guess, well, I don't know. I thought that that was what people call bilocating, but maybe mm -hmm. there's different... Uh, different term for that i mean i've seen uh, i had a you know an early experience which just blew me away it was okay. like it just sort of changed well I, i've had many sort of life changing things but one of the early ones was uh uh doing a uh it was table tipping i'm okay. sure you know what that is not by term but if you tell go keep explaining well, I had never heard of it. Okay. I mean, what do I know? And I was in Wales, in Great Britain. Okay. And I was in a castle that I had picked because it was reputed to be haunted. So, of course, I wanted to go there. And um, it turned out it had been previously owned by a uh, an opera singer who had, I guess she died. She'd fallen down a flight of stairs. And then it had been turned into a uh, hospital for kids in the early 20th century who had tuberculosis and you know those were the days where they put them up on the on the roof you know in their beds yeah where it was in the middle of winter because they figured it was good for their lungs and uh the roof in fact was made in part because they ran out of money it was made of um x-ray uh what do you call those those uh the hard x-ray frames you know right. what I'm talking about? Yes, yes, yes. The, the, the whole roof was shingled with those from these oh, poor kids with tuberculosis. Anyway, so I went there, and uh, there they had a, a guy there who uh, took us around and said, okay, we're going to do this table, tip, table tipping down in the cellar. And the cellar was pitch black. They put, There was a very hard, heavy, round table that they put six of us around it. And I got to sit next to the, uh, she was the Welsh medium. Okay. And um, there was one little tea candle that was lit right in the center of the table. And they said, well, you know, just uh, all of you put your hands on the, on the top of the table, including your thumbs, so you can't lift it. And even if you wanted to, by the way, it was really too heavy. Right. Uh, and just focus on it and see what happens. And after a while, this table uh, began to turn counterclockwise it would and it would jump so it would jump maybe six inches up in the air and then crash down and then it would jump again okay above you above you okay well i mean it, it was off the ground i mm -hmm. couldn't tell at that point how far off the ground it was yeah. but it's clearly you know because my knees we were all so close my knees were touching the knees of the two people on either side of me uh, and nobody was like thumping this thing. And even if you wanted to, to make it jump and turn counterclockwise for several jumps like that would have been really difficult. I checked for wires. I checked yeah. for, you know, anything that they could have been. It, it just, it, there was nothing. Okay. And even the, uh, this leader of this thing, 
uh, he got all excited. He called the, <laughs> uh, oh no, it was before he called the other group down. And um, so as we're continuing, oh, I think I screamed the first time it jumped. Right. He got really angry. I had screamed, and this one other woman who was sitting there screamed because I was not expecting the trouble to come. And um, then at a certain moment, the my half of the table went floating up in the air. Now, all of our hands are still on it, but we could barely touch the top of it because it was roughly, uh, let's see, I would say about a foot and a half above my head. And the funny thing was that it was only the table was uh, only going up on our side. Okay. On the other side, and they had monitors. Right. It was going. It was off the ground by about an inch, and it just kind of floated up there. And then it floated down like it was on clouds. So obviously, I knew it was none of us on our side doing anything. It was impossible. And there were EMF meters and things all around the table. We had the highest reading between me and the medium. And um, apparently, and I, none of us who were sitting at the table saw this, but the monitors around us saw a huge flash of, uh, I think it was white light, that went off above the table and then zoomed off into a corner, dark corner, and disappeared. Okay. Do you think... Why do you think that occurred? Well, what's interesting was, and I had never had this experience, Mm -hmm. I noticed about myself, because I'm sort of a scientist, I guess, at heart, and I noticed that I would have a premonition of every single time that this thing was about to jump. Okay. It was as if, if you could imagine that your brain is like a, a city that's being lit up by electricity and suddenly goes into a brownout. That's how I would feel. And then I would know, and then within seconds, this table would jump and twist and turn or float. Jeez. So I, I do believe that I was somehow on some level, I don't know to what degree, instrumental in some of that physical action. Now, whether I was being used or whether that was coming from me i don't know oh so you don't know if it was coming from you the spirit or something else correct the source yeah you're unsure about the source in that sense which is a strange experience yes (laughs) that is a strange experience can i share with i i have a lot of them but i mean all kinds but can i share with you one one of mine Oh, totally, yeah. Okay, I became friends with this witch doctor that was in Africa. I meet all types of people, so it's not, I mean, I used to teach uh, dancing to the mob's wife. So meeting a witch doctor, what wasn't anything (laughs) big? (laughs) Anyways, I was doing my interviews, this was a couple months ago, I can't mention any names, but this one late lady that was, uh, her name Middle name was Ann. That's all I'm going to say. And she was involved in some stuff that she should have not have been involved with. And I had a friend of mine that was a San Diego retired police detective that took a look at what she was doing and said, stay away from her. It may not be good at all. And I confronted her if she was involved with snuff films, okay? And anyway, she didn't say she was or she wasn't, of course. She's not going to. But... You still there? Yeah, I lost you though. Okay, so I guess we're we're okay. I guess I got my sound on here, but bottom line to recap things: where did we lose each other? <laughs> <laughs> I, okay, I was talking about the witch doctor, and okay, so what? One, she, I'm sorry. No, I was gonna say. So her 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 name was Anne. Mid, middle name was she, Anne. Middle name was Anne. She got involved in stuff she shouldn't have been involved in, and that's why I lost you. Okay, okay. Uh, Possibility that she could have been involved with snuff films. Anyways, I was sleeping one night. I went to bed, and I got a a night tear. It was, I was sweating a lot. I saw this vision of a man that came to me, very warm, 
gentle. He was that man that I met that was a witch doctor. In his hand, he had that name Ann, and he had a piece of paper. All of a sudden, it went poof, and it lit on fire. It went away, and I woke up. I was sh shaking. I couldn't figure out, right? So I go back to sleep. And I w see his hand again. I see five pieces of garlic in his hand. And they're getting rotten. And they're turning black now. And all of a sudden, I wake up. So I knew that was a sign of some type of war warning for me, is what I'm trying to say. To stay away from this per per person. Yeah. And I did. It's just, what, what I'm trying to say is sometimes people that we don't even know show us a lot of love you know you need you know what i'm saying uh totally i totally get it i mean i i think they're all your dream is really interesting and if i knew more about the circumstances i think that there's a whole ton of data there yes there is yes yes but i'm just giving the brief and there's so many things that i could go into but i want to talk to you <laughs> you know it's interesting you talk about a uh a voodoo type of a thing. I did a reading for a, a, a client who um, was originally from Africa, and the night before his reading, I had a. a he was concerned that he may have been the object of uh, a curse. Okay. And uh, there were, you know, different circumstances, and you could have looked at it a bunch of different ways. You know, uh, it could have been a bunch of different things. But the night before the reading, I had a dream that I was um, following a, I guess what you would call a witch doctor, into a circle of people. The mm -hmm. people had already created a circle. And so I was sort of the apprentice. And okay. I was following the witch doctor into the center of the circle. And I was holding a branch of something leafy okay. for the witch doctor, which apparently I handed to the witch doctor and then everything was terrific and I'm out of the dream. <laughs> okay. So so the next day, I because, you know, y our minds work in very, very interesting ways. And I decided, I said to myself, well, when, maybe that branch, I mean, what the heck was I holding a branch of, you know, like a tree branch for? What was that? And I, I said, Okay, well, if I were just to make a, a sort of intuitive guess, what did those leaves look like? And I tried to remember what the leaves looked like, and I thought, well, they, it sort of looks like um, uh, laurel. And so I decided to look up uh, laurel online, and it turns out that laurel and bay leaves and whatever are – apparently specifically used by certain groups to get rid of certain poltergeist huh, okay, uh, okay. Curse activity. Like sage, then. okay. I, I guess so, yeah. Okay. But, I mean, but the point is that I had no idea. Yeah, no, I, no, I know. And what this, this client was complaining about was a certain amount of what you could have interpreted as poltergeist activity. Yes, that, and that could be scary. That um, that could be. Uh, do you think that could be part of being possessed? Maybe. Well, yeah. I mean, the the whole thing about poltergeist is that it's you know there's usually either a, a young kid or a confused human involved, and they're being kind of uh, their energy is being used. Yeah. Yeah. They're being taken, but. There are so many cons out there in this world that try to take people for a ride in the sense they tell them, oh, you know, you have a curse on you. Not me, but I've heard stories. I never, I give free read readings to people if they're trying to deal with death in the family or um, just because I believe in to help, you know, I want to help pe people in that sense. But there's so many cons out there that try to tell people they're cursed and then they charge them, you know, m lots of m money to get rid of the curse. And unfortunately, they're going to get cursed. <laughs> well, yeah, what goes around comes around. Exactly, exactly. Um, so what was the outcome of, of this case then? Yeah, I, 
I don't remember the the outcome in particular. I mean, there wasn't an outcome by the time I delivered my reading, but uh, okay. what I told him was apparent because what I do, I've um, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, remote viewing. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. And I have developed my own style of remote viewing, and I've done this for about ten years, and I've um, it, it's it's heavily documented so that you can tell you know what data, if any, I'm working with when I start out on a case or, or with, a, with a reading with a client. And then you can, uh, it's all documented what I come up with before I ever speak with them. And then I go through a process of confirmation. And so, and then I score it and judge it and all that kind of stuff. So, and I deliver certain messages based on what I think are likely um, predictions. And... Um, I, as I recall, I, I scored pretty well on that case. I mean, it was um, I got a lot a lot of confirmations of the data that I'd given to this uh, client. Nancy, before we continue, why don't we give everybody your website to where they can find you, any books you have out there, and that kind of stuff as well. Oh well, thank you. Um, yeah, the, I mean, the website main website is theskepticalpsychic.com. I have another one which uh, is not as well developed. It's called TalkAlien.com because we didn't get into that topic yet. Um, I have published five books, but the most important, or the most, the two most recent, I would say, or the most applicable. Uh, one is called How to Talk to an Alien, and the other is called Psychic Intuition: Everything You Ever Want to Ask But Were Afraid to Know. Interesting. I, I <laughs> have a couple quite questions for you, but uh, there's so many things where we have a few more mi minutes, but I'd love to have you come back and talk more about the other stuff. I'd be delighted. It's always nice to talk to a, uh, a colleague in the biz. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, my question for you now, in the remote viewing, you said you develop your own way, your own style. What yeah. is it? What, can we talk about it or no? Oh yeah, I mean, I would love to. Actually. Okay. Okay. Uh, do you do you want to uh, take a break here, or do you want me to keep going? Uh, keep going. If you're okay, I'm okay. All right. Um, it's called TSP, and uh, I'm actually I've been invited to speak at the Society for Scientific Exploration uh, in June in Colorado, and I'm going to be speaking on that topic. Congratulations, first of all. Thank you. Uh, it's, you know, a lot of people, I, I know, well, let me put it this way. My, my, one of my mentors was Ingo Swan, who was the guy who, along with two laser physicists, Hal Puttoff and Russell Targ, created um, CRV, Controlled Remote Viewing, okay. back in okay. 1973. And I know a lot of the people involved in the remote viewing field and I know that many of them feel that if it's not CRV, it ain't remote viewing. Huh. And um, I think all you got to do is look at the definitions, even how these guys define remote viewing, which is the ability to perceive things, you know, at a, um, uh, a distance or a time frame that is out of our current um, sensory perceptual ability okay and if you look at it that way absolutely this is a form of remote viewing it's just different and okay. i use my background you know being a psychic detective a medium i use i'm also trained for more than 20 years in intuitive gestalt psychotherapy i use that background um i I, and, and all of my, I'm trained in crv arv erv all the different uh, remote viewing techniques and i sort of did what seems to work quite well. And I now I've got, well, as I said, I've got about 10 years worth of, um, of uh, documented work. And I would say I've got a couple of years worth now of, um, you know, the actual perfected transcripts that I use for this. A lot of work. It's, it's the main point is it's effective for you. And that's the main point. And for other people, if you could teach them how to do it. I have been for the last year I've been teaching them. Um, so, and it seems to be working really well. I've got a lot of students who are, you know, coming back. They want more. 
So, and, and they've been, you know, happy with the results. So, and I can, the ones who have already come back, uh, I can see their degree of improvement. And every time that I'm doing, um, it's generally, it's a nine week course. Um, I generally do one big operational case. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we've worked on um, uh, homicide cases, you know, active and cold in the past. And I have some other things up my sleeve for some some of my future classes. So yeah, so if anybody is interested in that, um, definitely get in touch with me on my website, theskepticalpsychic.com. Okay, now with these uh, remote classes, uh, besides trying to improve themselves, what is the goal? What do they want to accomplish? You know, that's something I... I ask every student right from the get-go right? because what I have found <laughs> is that most people don't have a clue why they want to do this kind of work. They really don't. Um, so some people tend to veer off more towards the, you know, the, the healing end of this. Right. And I do medical intuitive and energy healing work as well. Um, some people, the very few, you know, they like the, the psychic detective angle. Um, some people like the remote viewing angle of just being able to um, make uh, extremely well-documented types of predictions. So, yeah, but I, I think in general, people don't, they don't know how they're going to incorporate it. I just tell them, ultimately, it doesn't really matter because okay. you, you, I became a better lawyer uh, because of all of my training. And you can become better at whatever it is that you do because it puts you on this super highway of information. That's understandable. At the same time, I've done a lot of medical intuitive work too. And there's been at times, I was I never done, I, I've had uh, a lot of smells come to me from the human body when I've done uh, prayer work or in the sense of somebody was bleeding inside and I could smell their blood. Or oh, wow. if they had medicine, their urine would have a certain strange smell. So right. my nose, and I was never strong in that viewpoint of uh, being a remote type sense, you know, in the me me med medical intuitive side. But it does come once in a while. So you help strengthen these things. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, you got me thinking of a, there was one case that uh, when I was training, we were given um, a piece of paper and told to write down any impressions we got off this piece of paper. And as we're holding the piece of paper, and there were uh, probably six other women, I think, who were all sitting around this very large room, and one was in a different room. And all of a sudden, I smell a stench that was really bad. And it smelled like something rotting. And I thought, oh, my goodness, you know, maybe there's a the cat has dragged something in or maybe they they put it under my chair. Maybe somebody left the door open, which was, you know, right behind me. Not nothing, nothing, nothing. And eventually and then I started to blame it on the woman next to me. And she got really insulted. And um, <laughs> she said, whatever that is, it stinks. And then everybody started to smell it. Uh, it was the smell of dead, rotting flesh, and as it turned out, the piece of paper that we were holding, that we had no clue what it was, uh, was regarding a young man who had gone missing, uh, who about a month later we found out had been murdered, throw down, thrown down a garbage chute, and Ooh. ended up in a Pennsylvania landfill, which therefore would make a whole lot of sense about why we got this incredible smell, and it wasn't... It didn't operate like a real smell. Wow. Uh, yeah, it's quite a bit. Yes, yes. And and again, Nancy, I want to thank you so much for being here. We're getting ready to close the show. But would you like to say anything to our audience before we leave? No, I'm, I'm just really grateful for the opportunity, opportunity to come on and, and to speak with you. And it's really oh, a, thank you. a pleasure to speak with somebody who is knowledgeable about all this stuff. Well, thank you very much. Hold on for one minute. I'd just like to wish everybody a wonderful evening. 
God bless you. I'd like to thank our guest, a skeptical psychic, Nancy. How do you say your name one more time? Duterte. <laughs> thank you for your help. We'll be back again, folks. <laughs> Thank you for listening to this episode of the Richard Spazoff Show. For more episodes and information, join us online at PsychicMediumSpazoffShow.com or catch the show on Spreaker, iHeartRadio, iTunes, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast service. The Richard Spazoff Show is a proud member of the HC Universal Network family of podcasts. For more great content and shows, visit HCUniversalNetwork.com or download our free HC Universal Network podcast app from your favorite device market. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. And until next time, keep, keep watching watch on the dark darkness. Dark, dark, dark.